Hello and good evening, everybody. My name is Tanya Day, and thank you for joining me and the Orange County Historical Museum and our fabulous guest tonight for Date Night Restaurants of Orange County. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few things. The first is that this session is being recorded. We'll be sure to make this available to you soon. And since we are recording, please keep your microphones off and your video cameras off throughout the entirety of the event. We will have time at the end for questions. You can just pop them into the chat box and our featured speaker will be able to answer them. Um, at this time, oh, I, I would like to remind you, if you're having trouble seeing the speaker, you can choose to put it on active speaker view. It makes a world of difference, active speaker view. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Sherry Apple. Sherry Apple has just stepped down from a fantastic term as our board chair, but she has decided to remain on the board, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, we're so thankful for her support and for her expertise. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Sherry Apple. Thank you again for being here with us tonight. Good evening and welcome to the Orange County Historical Museum's latest Thursday evening lecture. And thank you, Tanya. Um, last month, the museum opened its latest exhibit, Date Night in Orange County, Fashion, Food, Music, and Fun. It goes from 1900 to 1999, and I hope all of you will take up the opportunity to come to Hillsboro and check it out. It really is a lot of fun. And I'm sure you're gonna see something in that exhibit that reminds you of some of your own date nights. I also wanna mention that this week we've started our friends fundraising drive. Be a link in the chain is a way to connect your personal history with the history of this amazing county. We hope you'll check it out. Um, there are lots of benefits at different levels. We really need the support to keep going in our way, we've got some exciting things ahead. We're continuing to offer programs, to offer exhibits, and we want to, you to be our friend. Um, finally, I want to hope you'll mark your calendars for June the 12th. The museum is gonna be sponsoring an in-person fundraiser. Actually, it's gonna be an afternoon of music down at the Orange County Courthouse uh, from two to five with Catherine Whalen's Jazz Squad and Austin singer, Nick Taylor. You may know Miss Whalen from the Squirrel Nut Zippers. She has an incredible voice. Again, our details are at the website and I know um, Tanya's gonna show, have that website either in the chat box or also at the end of the, the evening. Now it is my privilege to really um, present a longtime friend of the museum who is our guest speaker tonight, Chris Holliday, he has an MA in history from NC Central, a BA from UNC. He's the author of numerous publications about the history and food of the region, as well as baseball across the United States. He knows a lot about baseball. In fact, he recently taught a course on NC baseball history at Duke. Chris is a member of the Preservation North Carolina, North Carolina Association of Historians, Association of the, for the Study of African American Life and History, and the Southern Foodways Alliance, just to name a few. Tonight, we're going to hear and learn more about his latest book and about something I really like because I am kind of a foodie. Classic Restaurants of Chapel Hill in Orange County, his, his book is published by American Palette. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you very much. And thank you, Tanya and Courtney at the museum. Um, so today I just want to talk a little bit about the restaurant history of the area and the county. Oh, start my video. There we go. Now you should be able to see me. Um, this area has such a really interesting restaurant history. And that's what, well, what starts me with restaurants is the most important thing is like the memory associated with it. I mean, everyone who goes to restaurants, I mean, the food is important. Everyone wants good food. Also want an experience. You wanna have, you know, memories made there. And that can be, you know, a graduation, a prom night and a date. I mean, a dinner and a movie is one of the classic date things that everyone has done 
throughout, you know, since there have been restaurants. So I figured I would just show some slides, a little bit about restaurant history, where people went. Some of them are well-known places, some of them probably not as well-known, but they all have an interesting, they all play an interesting part in the restaurant history of this county. So I'm gonna share my screen and just go through a slideshow. And then afterwards, I'll, you can ask questions or you can just put them in the chat right now and then we'll talk about them later. But I'm gonna start my slideshow. And there we go. So this book started, well, actually it's two books. It, um, this began, actually it began with a cookbook I did a couple years ago called Southern Breads. I did it with a woman who was the culinary instructor at Southern Season. And a little bit after that, a year or so afterwards, the publisher of that book approached me and asked if they knew anyone who'd be interested in doing a restaurant history of Raleigh Durham Chapel Hill area. And my first thought was that's way too big of an area. All those places have their own restaurant history. They're all very different. And so I really wasn't interested. I was in grad school at the time, I was busy. But then the more I thought about it, the more I thought that it would be fun to do it. I mean, I love restaurants. I've worked in restaurants in this area. And then also while I was in grad school, just coincidentally, I met Patrick Cullum, who is the co-author of this book. And Patrick is a photo archivist at Wilson Library at UNC. And so I got to know him while in grad school and he's really a great researcher and he knew where to find some really good pictures. That's part of his job. And so he pulled a lot of things together and we did some great research and it was a lot of fun to, to do these books. And I started saying that the publisher wanted one book for all three. So we got them to divide it up and we did the book on Durham first, which came out last it's been a pandemic, not a good time for a book on restaurants or a book of any sort, really. And then the Chapel Hill and Orange County book came out in December. And so it was really kind of strange writing about restaurants during the pandemic because a lot of them are closing or they're struggling. But hopefully the corner has been turned and the restaurants will be back and the great restaurant story of this area will continue. So I'm just going to show some interesting pictures in you know, restaurants started small. Everyone thinks about them now, how important they are in you know, our daily lives, but there were, really were no restaurants in this whole area, probably until the late 1800s, I mean, like 1890s, probably in Durham. Chapel Hill was even a little bit later because it was smaller. And the first places that opened were like small hot dog stands, sandwich shops. And then in Chapel Hill, because of university, the um, they had some small cafes and then uh, cafeterias were popular and that became a, a, uh, a popular thing. Students could even get meal plans in these cafeterias, even though they weren't part of the university. And this was one right here. It's just, I think this was just called Carolina Cafeteria. It was on Franklin Street. And this was another, this ad over here for White House Cafe. I like it says headquarters for Carolina men because UNC was all men at that time. And this was from the 1920s. And, but they're showing a date right there. So I thought it was a nice ad. Mm -hmm. And then in Hillsborough, in places that were smaller, like Carborough was a mill town, Hillsborough was too, and they were smaller. And they mostly were, you know, they had small cafes and, you know, they weren't really, I wouldn't say it was a place to take a date perhaps, but maybe this was one that was in Hillsborough. This was a called Tip Top Barbecue. And in Hillsborough, if you know where uh, Ixtapa restaurant is, right across from Weaver Street Market across the river, that's where this, this place was. It was a gas station barbecue joint. They had ice cream, just an interesting picture. But that spot has been several different restaurants over the years. And then the first really big push for more unique restaurants began in Chapel Hill, probably in the late 30s. And that's when Danziger's candy shop opened. And the Danziger family was big in restaurants in the area for many years, up until the early 2000s, really. But uh, Edward Danziger came over from Austria. And when he arrived in Chapel Hill, he wanted to open an Austrian themed candy store and gift shop. And it had a small little restaurant cafe in the back, as you can see right there. And it was very popular and it was popular with students or visitors to the town just because it was kind of unique. And this was um, in the 1942, during World War II, um, 
the Naval Pre-Flight School happened in Chapel Hill where all the Naval cadets came to town to you know, learn basic training before they learned to fly. So fitness and everything, they were in town. And for that took place for over three years. But this was an ad for Danziger's candy shop that uh, focused on you know, bringing in the cadets. But I like that it says, bring your wife and meals prepared for the maids night off. So these, these ads were aimed at you know, date night for the Naval cadets and the officers. And so it was just, it was just kind of a funny advertisement. But Danziger's led to something even bigger which became really famous, and that's the Raskeller. And Edward Danziger's son, Ted, began this restaurant underneath his father's candy store right after the war, I think maybe 1947. And it was just a basement down there. And he began digging it out and expanding it. And he eventually opened the Raskeller, which became a very unique place. Anyone who ever went there, it was talked about everywhere. You can see this one room had this stalactite ceilings. It really looked like a cave. You know, was known for their beer and their their food and and also their their wait staff like these guys here like this guy here on the left was Kenny Mann he was the chef there from I think 1947 to 2003 so all the waiters and the chefs worked there for many many years and everyone who went there knew them and this was the menu I found now, I'm not exactly sure what year this is from probably from the 80s I'm betting but you can see some of the food they offered there to people. Like the double gambler and the single gambler, they were popular meals and I like their, uh, their description, a chewy, elongated, highly inedible half pound of rustled steer. So it was all very tongue in cheek, but it was, it was popular for that. And also their uh, lasagna and spaghetti and pizza. It was always a big place for pizza. And Okay, this was a little bit different. This was a supper club. This is Terrace View Supper Club. And this was actually a place most you'll probably have not heard of, but this was out on 54, just west of Carborough. And this opened in the early 40s and it didn't really have a super long life, although the building is still there, but it was aimed at dates. It was food, dancing, they served dinner, couples only, as you can see right there. And it was open every night. And here's another ad, you know, $1 minimum per person. You know, Western T-bone steaks. It's just funny to look at these old ads and they had bands there. And this was the, the building right there. And that building is still there and this is it now. It's been modified. They put a second story on there with the windows all match up. So it's the same building, it's a church now. But it, that, was a, that was owned by a guy I'll get to again in a minute. His name was Ephthemios Tommy Mariakakis. He was from Greece. He came to Chapel Hill in the 30s, but he played a huge role in the Chapel Hill restaurant industry. And I'll, I'll go back to him in a minute, but he was the owner of that supper club. And this was another one. This was Starlight Supper Club, which was pretty much the equivalent, except this was in the black business section of Chapel Hill. As everyone knew back then, black and white were separated. So the black business area of Chapel Hill was centered around Graham Street where Graham and Rosemary come together. So this guy, Charlie Mason owned several places there. He also owned a motel, I think, but he owned the supper club and they brought in bands and it was you know, steaks and seafood and even air conditioning, which was a big thing in the 1950s when this ad was from. And another place that anyone who was around Chapel Hill from the 40s up until the mid 80s would know of was called Brady's and it was a big place to go it was down the road down the hill from campus going towards Durham and it just started out as like a small brick building but it was very popular for um, everything you know I think people always say pork chops when they mention it I, I mean I did this was before my time but and this is Brady's here. And uh, across the street, they actually opened a frozen custard stand. It was directly across from it. And that became very popular. So you could have dinner in the restaurant and then go across the street for your, your dessert. And eventually the frozen custard stand, they expanded it, it became more of a drive-in. It was very popular. And it finally closed, I think in the mid eighties. Well, I think it became uh, Snoopy's Hot Dogs in the early 80s for a couple of years. And then it finally closed and that whole area was redeveloped into sort of a 
business area, but there are restaurants there. I think Applebee's was down there for a while, but it's a it's still a known area. Now, here's another picture of Brady's. This is during the civil rights protests in 1963. I mean, it's not exactly a date night themed photo, but it's an important part of the restaurant history of this whole area and, and the whole South because restaurants were segregated. But Brady's, you know, it did desegregate and it continued on up until the uh, Brady had passed away and he sold it. And that site has been redeveloped as Siena Hotel, which opened in 1987. An Il Palio restaurant in Siena is obviously very well known for a, a high-end date experience, very, very nice restaurant. So it, that whole site still remains a place to take your date. And I mentioned the uh, Danziger family earlier, and they didn't just own the Rascal, they owned several restaurants around town. This was one called the Ranch House, and this was just down uh, Airport Road from downtown Chapel Hill, going towards Hillsboro. And it uh, was kind of a unique Western themed place. You can see the uh, bar stool here had a saddle on it. It was, a, it was a, quite the place from the pictures I've seen. And it was just a steakhouse, but it was a place where people took out of town visitors to try to impress them. And here's another picture just showing the couples in there eating. And it was, you know, like most big steakhouses, that was how you impressed your date back then was taken for a steak. That was, that was a fancy dinner out on the town. And um, the Danzigers also owned a couple other restaurants anyone who's been around might have heard of. One of them was called Zoom Zoom, and that was on Franklin Street, the first block west of uh, Columbia Street. And they also owned Villa Teo, which was going downhill towards, uh, towards where Brady's was. So uh, the Danzigers played a big role in this area for many, many years. And then another period in the area of restaurant history sort of began in the 70s. Um, you know, most, most restaurants weren't really that fancy. Everyone sort of ate the same thing. Steak was the high end. That's where you took your date. You wanted to impress. It was a little more expensive. But, you know, or you could have a burger somewhere. And, you know, even at days of segregation, everyone pretty much ate the same thing. Black or white, you ate, you know, barbecue, Brunswick stew and hamburgers and then steak was the fancy night out or maybe seafood but in the sort of in the 70s the culinary offering started expanding restaurants became a little more interesting and Harrison's was kind of one of the first to sort of be a little bit different and it, it didn't really last that long maybe less than 10 years but it was opened by a guy named Mickey Yule and he had moved here from uh, Washington DC from the Georgetown area and he had liked some of the bars in that area they were a little bit different, a little more upscale than what was around Chapel Hill and in this whole area, you know, just, and so they had a dress code. They're not fancy, but you couldn't go in there and cut off jeans and a t-shirt. You had to be a little bit dressed up. And so Harrison's opened and it was successful, but a couple of years later, Mickey Yule decided to open Spanky's and Spanky's was a hugely successful restaurant for many, many years. I think it opened in 77 or 78. And it closed in, I think, 2017 or 18. So it was around a long time. And this is how it looked in its first incarnation. This was right at the corner of Franklin Street in Columbia. And this had been a, a pharmacy, it had been several things. I think it was a Swenson's ice creams before it was a Spanky's for a little while. And then this is the original menu of Spanky's I thought was kind of interesting. You, know, you get London broil for $6.95 spinach manicotti for 515 you know and your and your basic burgers but it sort of changed just a little bit different atmosphere there and the whole spanky's thing that led to a sort of a, a small little uh, empire of restaurants in chapel hill and this in this area um, because after this became a uh, squids opened up some employees who had worked at spanky's wanted to open a seafood restaurant so they partnered with mickey Yule and started what became known as Chapel Hill Restaurant Group. It still is. They opened Squids. They soon opened 411 West, which is still there, more of an Italian theme, and a few other restaurants, some out towards um, like Page Road Grill. And they changed Spanky's into what was called Lula's. But unfortunately, before it got its own identity established, the pandemic came and it, they decided to close it. So there is a restaurant in that space at the moment, but so 
but Spanky's made a lasting impression on uh, Chapel Hill. And this is a more modern picture of it just from a few years ago. It's, but it's, it was very popular. And also had an upstairs in the bar upstairs. And this was a popular place that actually that my wife and I went to quite a bit when we were dating, when we were in school, because for one, it was cheap for students and it was good. It was, you know, mostly pizza. And this was Mariakakis. And this is, I mentioned Tommy Mariakakis before who owned the uh, dance club. He sort of expanded into other restaurants. He had a hot dog stand and then he eventually opened what became what was called Quickie Takeout and Keg Room, which was just pizza and beer. And at that time, it was interesting that, you know, Merikakis, even though he was Greek, he didn't really serve Greek food. I mean, Greek food was considered exotic for the normal Southern culinary taste. And so most of the Greeks who were in the restaurant industry, and there were quite a lot, uh, Merikakis, the Galifianakis family in Durham and also in Chapel Hill had restaurants. Um, they mainly just served what we would just call American food. But by around, this, uh, the first Mariakakis, the Quickie Takeout opened around 1962, but around the early 70s, he started calling it Quickie Takeout and Mariakakis Bakery. And then around 1980, he changed the whole thing into Mariakakis Restaurant. It had more of a Greek theme, um, more traditional Greek dishes, was more unique. And people were more interested in, you know, more unique foods at that time, I think. And, and I mentioned um, the Galifianakis family, Pete Galifianakis, his uh, brother was uh, Nick, he was a congressman and his other brother owned Lincoln Cafe in Durham. But Pete Galifianakis started uh, Hector's, which was very popular on uh, Franklin Street around that same time, around 1969, 1970. And mentioning pizza, this was an interesting thing. Pizza we think of now as being very common, that pizza's everywhere, everyone needs pizza, but it was pretty unique, I mean, it was pretty, exotic in the 50s. And so one of the first places to serve it, the Rats Killer could have been first place in Orange County, but this place, it was called La Pizza. It was in Carborough in a building right there on West Main Street in Carborough. And the building is still there. It started out as a place called Ivy's. It opened in the late 40s. And Ivy's was unique because it just served traditional Southern fare. But it was funny because it had a, it advertised that it had a large screen television, all 16 inches, where they showed one TV show per night. You could come watch it in 1949. That was pretty unusual for that time. But uh, Ivy's closed after a couple of years and it became La Pizza, probably around 1952 or so. And they even delivered to campus. It was kind of unique to have pizza delivery back then. But that building now, it's been many restaurants, it became Martini's in the 70s became uh, Maggie's Muffins, and then now it is uh, Akihana, a Japanese restaurant, sushi, and it's really nice and it's been there since the early 2000s. And mentioning pizza, this is an, another one I wanted to show. I mean, pizza chains are pretty much everywhere. Pizza Hut, everyone knows Pizza Hut, but this Pizza Hut was very different. This was on Franklin Street, if anyone knows this building. Um, this Pizza Hut opened around 1977. And at that time, Pizza Hut came in and bought this space and wanted to redevelop it and build the traditional Pizza Hut shaped building you see everywhere, but the town wouldn't let them. So they had to work with what was there with this old gas station, the old pure oil gas station. So they opened the Pizza Hut there. It was very different. And in all of the United States at that time, I think there were 1500 Pizza Huts. This was the only one that did not conform to the traditional Pizza Hut uh, style. So it was just kind of unique. I thought I would show that even though it's Pizza Hut and not very, uh, it's just everywhere. So, um, and this was the, probably the most unique pizza place, kind of the opposite of Pizza Hut was called Peppers. And that was in Chapel Hill. It opened in 1987 and it moved a couple of times. It was on the south side of Franklin Street. Then it moved to the north side. And this is on the north. And uh, I wasn't sure what year this picture was from. But then I looked at the movie showing up here and looked them up. And it appears to be 1998 because the Varsity Theater was right next door. So Peppers was an interesting place. The people who worked there were interesting. It was just different, you know, interesting topics. I mean, interesting toppings. So. It, it was a different place and unfortunately it's gone now too. 
These are a couple of other places. Well, this was actually became one place that I thought I would mention that was popular with students. Burger Chef was a chain, I think, based in the Midwest somewhere that came to Chapel Hill in the 60s, I think 1966. And it opened on Rosemary Street. They all had their, like Pizza Hut, they had their signature building shape that they put up everywhere. And it didn't last very long, only a couple of years. But then uh, Bredman's took it over. And Bredman's was, you know, started by a Carolina graduate. And I think that was his last name, actually. And he, it became a super popular place for students, you know, after, especially in the morning, it was a breakfast sort of place, but I'm sure there were many dates out there too. And it, uh, I think it opened in 74. And just this past year, um, they've been talking about, well, actually it moved. It moved from the site of the Burger Chef. It moved across the street to what had been Western Sizzlin, just a chain steakhouse. Actually, my wife worked there when she was in college, but uh, it was there for many years from probably the 90s up until last year. And then they redeveloped that space to uh, more condos, I think, in Chapel Hill. So Bredman's now is on Elliott Road in Chapel Hill. And this is another interesting place. I mean, it, I don't know much about this restaurant, but the building, everyone knows it because it's been a restaurant probably since the 30s continuously, many, many restaurants. And it was called University Restaurant originally probably dating back to the 30s. And this is an ad from 1942 because they were you know, trying to bring in, they are promoting it to advertise to the people at the Naval Pre-Flight School. Bring your dates, as you can see right there. And another one, you know, bring your date here, Kansas City Steaks and Seafood are our specialty. This was right next door to the post office, downtown Chapel Hill. And this is it right here. You can see it, the building right there. And it's interesting to look at these old pictures of Chapel Hill because people parked going in at an angle on Franklin Street, just different. But this strip right here looks pretty much the same except for the facade of that building. And that's it right now, Four Corners, most people know. But before it was Four Corners, it was Harry's in the 1960s. And Harry's was a restaurant, it was, I mean, most people would say it was the most famous restaurant in Chapel Hill from the late 20s up until it finally closed in 1972. And it moved three times. It was started by a guy named Harry, he sold it. Then another guy named Harry bought it coincidentally. So it had an owner named Harry for many years. And the last Harry, this is his son, Ralph Macklin, who took it over in the 60s. And he's talking with Howard Lee, who was the mayor of Chapel Hill. And this is 1969. But Harry's was kind of uh, popular with sort of the hippie crowd by that point. And it, it was kind of famous. Anyone who visited needed to go to Harry's because it was the hippie hangout. But it closed. And then that site was a couple other short-lived restaurants. And in 1978, a group of guys got together, including a assistant basketball coach, and took it over and started Four Corners, which had a basketball theme. All of the, all of the things on the menu were named after you know, basketball players. And it's still there. It's still a very popular place, popular place to take a date in Chapel Hill. Another famous date night restaurant was The Pines. And this was south of Chapel Hill, going almost into Durham County, probably on 54. And it, uh, right near the golf course. And it was a fancy restaurant. It was a steakhouse. And it, um, see, I'm gonna picture of it. No, that's a different one. Let me go back to The Pines. The Pines, it uh, started in the early 40s. It changed names a couple of times. Well, it didn't change names, it changed owners. And then finally in the 70s, it was bought by a guy named Slug Claiborne. That was his nickname. He was from Charlotte. He owned several restaurants there. So he just changed the name of this restaurant to Slugs at the Pines. And it was still a you know, destination place to take your, your date for, for many years up until probably in the late 90s. Then this space was taken over by Aurora Restaurant, which was another really nice high-end restaurant, which had been in Carborough and uh, Carmel Mall. But this spot, uh, now it's been redeveloped. I think it's an office now. It was a big date night destination for many years. This was another steakhouse. I mean, the steakhouses were very popular for many years. And this was called the Country Squire. And I like what they offered here for only $2. One pound steak, baked potato, salad, garlic bread, cheese and crackers, and a free mug of beer. That's just kind of funny. And this 
spot, this restaurant, which was this is from the 1960s, I think, it lasted up until the early 80s. And it was right where they put I-40 through on 15501, just uh, beside like kind of where Home Depot and all that is now. This, this restaurant sat right there until they took it with eminent domain, I guess. And then we have to talk about the Carolina coffee shop. I mean, there's a lot of popular restaurants in the area that I'm not even gonna get into that we all know, like Crook's Corner and La Residence, wonderful restaurants, great menus, um, great chefs, but I need to talk about Carolina coffee shop because it is the oldest restaurant in North Carolina and it is in Orange County. And it is on Franklin Street, it opened in 1922. And they always aimed at Dates, as you can see, drop in before the dances on campus. And this, that's from, this is from the 30s, actually. And then this ad over here is from the 50s. And it just talks about, you know, back then it was just, again, steaks and seafood and Southern fried chicken. It wasn't anything too unique. Now it's a little bit different, but it's, it's still a nice restaurant. And this is it now. This is what it looks like. And it is still a popular place. And right back here, the uh, little blue awning right there, that was called Porthole Restaurant. And that was a popular place, open in the 40s and closed in the 80s. And then I think that building was bought by the university, but that was up sort of an alley to get to Porthole and it was a really popular restaurant. And then in Hillsborough, we have to talk about Hillsborough because the museum is in Hillsborough. The Colonial Inn was the the popular place. I mean, there were small places in Hillsborough that were around a long time, but none of them compared to the Colonial Inn. And the Inn opened in, uh, well, there's, there's dispute over when it opened, but it, this building was I think built in 1838. I think that's what they decided. But the restaurant part didn't really start until the forties. And so this is a menu from 1949. You can see what they offered. Again, it was steaks, ham, fried chicken. They even had crab and your basic vegetables, green beans, beets, stewed tomatoes, nothing too fancy, but uh, it was a popular place. And I think of it more as a place for a Sunday dinner with the family. I'm sure there were many dates there. It was sort of an, a more upscale place to take people. This is another menu from a little bit later. This is probably from the 90s or 80s. And you can see what they, their menu was similar, but a little bit different offerings. Still had your fried chicken, pork barbecue, pecan pie. Yeah, so this is what's always funny to me, Southern Old South cooking since 1759. That's <laughs> a bit of an exaggeration. And then people did go from Orange County to Durham County. And I'll just mention a couple places in Durham County that were, that were popular, that were sort of on the Western edge of Durham that you know, people would go to that were at the time kind of out in the country and one of the big ones was Saddle and the Fox which actually started out as Saddle Club but this restaurant opened in I think 1947 and it was started by a guy named Charlie Haynes who he'd gone to Duke and he had been in the army and in World War II and when he got home from that he decided to take a little bit of his family's land his family actually owned this big property and it was a horse farm which is kind of why it has a a horse theme to the whole restaurant. And so he opened this restaurant in what was kind of far out in the country. And it was, again, it was a fancy steakhouse and it had an oyster bar. And as you can see right here, this big pile on the left is actually oyster shells for many years, it looks like piling up right there. But it was, it was the place to go. As you can see, it was fancy. Here's inside, you know, even the wait staff in the seventies and these must be seventies tuxedos here with a frilly chest. Um, the, they were all wearing their tuxes and then the, the chef and his big hat and everything was kind of funny. And this is the inside of it. So you can see that it was fancy. This is from the 70s. And you can see over here the, uh, the um, pennants on the wall. They have Duke and UNC. So they promoted both places because they were sort of in between, even though closer to Duke. But it was one of the fancier places to go in the area at the time. And it was big too. And by the 80s, it had been, when I first came here, it had been redeveloped. Um, it had been split up. It became half Cattle's restaurant, half a steakhouse, and half Italian garden, which was kind of two restaurants in one building with different themes. It was kind of strange. But it was the same building because this big brick or stone fireplace was on the original. So it's 
it was popular. But that spot now is this. If you know Hillsborough Road, it's O'Reilly's Auto Parts, but that's exactly where Saddle and Fox was right there. And one other Durham restaurant I'll show was called Turnage's Barbecue. And again, it was west of Durham. This was on Maureen Road. And it was just a big building, nothing too fancy. And out back, they cooked pigs, they smoked them. And it was popular for all kinds of events. I mean, this isn't really a date. This is some kind of a civic group or something. But a lot of dates did go there. As you can see right here, I mean, this isn't the clearest picture, but it shows, you know, a group of guys and girls meeting up in there for dinner. And it was also very popular for their music. They had dancing and bands there, lots, jazz. It was very popular for that. Students and C students would go there. So it was, people did go to Durham a lot, you know, from Orange County. And sometimes they might've even slipped over to Angus Barn, you know, on the edge of Raleigh. But, you know, overall there were a lot of great dining options just in Orange County. And so, that's the end of my slideshow. I'll stop my share and just talk a minute. But, you know, in the past probably 20 years, all of the restaurants in this area have really changed. There's so much more diversity in food. Um, there's everything in this area you can get. And even in the towns that have grown, like Hillsborough had been small, there's so many new restaurants that have opened or, or more diverse restaurants. For, I mean, even Hillsborough Barbecue is I think 10 years old now, which is kind of surprising. And then um, Radius Pizza. Uh, Antonio's, which had been um, Tupelo's. I mean, that was a very good place. And then Wood Nickel is my famous, my famous, my favorite one. I love Wood Nickel. They have great food. And then right next door to it is a building that has been many restaurants. Uh, most recently, James Pharmacy, but the building is Pharmacy. But I think in the 80s, it was Luigi's Restaurant. It was uh, Flying Fish. It was Gulf Rim. It was Laplace. It's been many different restaurants, I'm sure. It will be another one again before long because I believe it's empty at the moment. And Carborough has come a long way too. Lots of new restaurants in Carborough. Some of them are like uh, pizza I talked about, like Pizzeria Mercado is a really an interesting new pizza place there that's um, run by a guy whose parents ran Magnolia Grill, one of the most famous restaurants in North Carolina. So it's a sort of second generation restaurant. Another one that falls into that category is Neil's Deli in uh, Carborough that uh, the guy who runs it, his uh, father was Bill Neal, who founded Crook's Corner. So there's so much great food in this area, interesting restaurant stories. Um, so it's, it's, been, it's been fun researching. And, and what really led me into it, too, my involvement in restaurants, when I was in school at UNC, I think the spring of 1987, I happened to go out they were looking for a part-time delivery person and so I applied I got the job but what that entailed was delivering coffee to restaurants so I got to know all the restaurants in this area through the back door and a lot of these places I never even ate at back then like La Residence it was very expensive as a college student kind of out of not in my budget but I got to know the whole restaurant area which is really unique I would go to Chapel Hill Durham and to Raleigh and and see all the different restaurants. So that sort of began my interest in the restaurants in this area, even before I started writing books and researching them formally. So I guess that's really all right now. I mean, if anyone wants to ask questions or talk about any places you remember, because like I said before, memory is the most important thing with restaurants. You can remember the food, but more than likely you remember the, uh, the experiences you had there. So Tanya, you have any questions you wanna read to me? Yeah, this, first of all, this was fantastic. And I am now very hungry. Uh, and I have been making a list of all of the places that you say are still open and I'm gonna have to make pilgrimages to them all. And we've had some pretty interesting questions. And actually the first one, I didn't even think about this, but of course it would must have had an effect. Uh, this area was dry for so long. Yeah, that, that, that was a big thing when that changed. And I mentioned, um, Mickey Yule before, the guy who started uh, Spanky's and all that, he was one of the people who really helped push for that legislation. He started a group to get that change where you could serve liquor by the drink. And I think that began in 1976, I believe that's right, 76 or 77. And actually the first, 
The first liquor license in Orange County went to uh, Papagayo, which was a Mexican restaurant in, in Chapel Hill. And, but that, that did play a huge role in you know, allowing people to have more options for restaurants, make them more uh, financially feasible, I guess. Because there's a lot more money you made on alcohol is actual just food, so. That's very late. That's, that's yeah. fascinatingly late, the 70s. Yeah. They did a vote, I think, in all, well, in several locations across the state at the same time. I want to say maybe four or five locations. And I think it only passed in maybe two of them at that time. I mean, later it did. But I think here and maybe uh, somewhere like maybe Pinehurst or Southern Pines passed. But the other, other ones around the state failed. So it was interesting. Cool. And then you alluded to this a little bit. Um, this idea about the influx of a variety of palettes really starting to be uh, catered to and this influx of ethnic restaurants and different kinds yeah. of foods. Could you talk a little bit more about that and some of the trends that they may have had here? I mean, like I was saying, everyone just ate sort of the same basic fried foods and vegetables and you know, it, it really expanded and, and especially Chapel Hill is a little smaller and Hillsborough even more so, but especially if you go to Durham, I mean, there's so many different options. I mean, you can, there's an Ethiopian restaurant in Durham now. You could, I couldn't have imagined that, you know, a few years ago, but it, it's, it's really expanded because people are more interested. They want to try new things and if people are new to the area, they move here from elsewhere and that some of them are people who open restaurants here and they bring with them that and some are people who are used to eating those things in other places. So it, it has really changed. And you can find about anything you want within 15 miles, you know, of this area anywhere. Yeah, Ethiopia. And you're, you're exactly right. It's sort of, I feel that now with people moving into the area with all these, these different cultural backgrounds and wanting to bring that culture of food with them, there's an atmosphere for people wanting to try new things, wanting to be a part of learning about a new culture through food. Because like you said, it's not just about the dish. It's about those memories yeah. you're making with a new dish. Mm -hmm. And speaking of new things, uh, one of our attendees would like to know, are there any new interesting restaurants that you've heard of opening up? That's been so hard to keep up with the past year just because of the pandemic stuff. And it's... Yeah. Some restaurants have closed. So hopefully that'll be a good question in about six months because, you know, hopefully the restaurant industry will turn around, new places will open back up. So I cannot think of anything right off the top of my head that's super new. Um, well, the Nomad in Hillsboro is new. I've not been there yet. That's a new one, which is more of sort of an Indian menu. That's different too. So um, there's a few others, but I have not kept up because I haven't been to restaurants in a while. So. <laughs> And I, how also does the new trend of food trucks kind of factor into that? That has been huge. And that has also been sort of a starting point for a lot of restaurants to end up becoming a, a brick and mortar restaurant. And it's, I think it's allowed people to try to learn the restaurant industry in a way that's not, because the restaurant's expensive to open. So a food truck's not cheap, but it's cheaper. And so, there's a lot of places that have started with that. It's turned popular and they opened um, a restaurant. One I can think of right now is Only Burger in Durham. And there's other ones and it allows people to move their truck to wherever there is, you know, a demand for it. So, and that does spread different tastes too because I know there's a lot of more ethnic flavors in food trucks even. So they can go wherever there's a crowd. So the food truck phenomenon is very unique and it has really helped to expand culinary diversity. You know, I didn't even think about that idea of going where the crowd is because I'm sure, you know, so often it doesn't matter how good your chef is. If you're not getting good footfall, you're, you're not doing good business. But yeah. if you can chase the people. Yeah. Oh, and we've just had a recommendation for food trucks. El Jefecito is great. They serve at Botanist and Barrel. Oh. Yeah. Um, would you, if someone were to come in from out of town, are there any key restaurants, like this is the one that you have to go to in the area, either because it's just phenomenally good 
or because it really encapsulates the area? I mean, I think the easy answer for that is Crook's Corner, that everyone kind of knows it. It's, it's very unique. It's one of the leaders in new Southern cuisine. I mean, it's famous across the country. It, it's- Oh, wow. Yeah, definitely people should go to Crook's at least once just to try it. It's, it's a neat building. It has a, it's been there since I think 1980 or 81, probably. It, it's, yeah, definitely Crook's. It's start there, then expand from there, I think. And so many, you've um, given us an overview of a lot of places in Orange County, including here in Hillsboro, where the Orange County Historical Museum is located. But out of all of these restaurants from Chapel Hill, I wonder, does the student population have a big influence on whether a restaurant does well or not? It does, and I think that's sort of become a challenge in Chapel Hill somewhat because when I was in school, you know, eating in the dining hall was not really exactly where you wanted to eat. It wasn't, it was just cheap and it was just food. But now there's a lot more interesting options in the dining hall, I think. So it's probably keeping people on campus maybe to eat, which would affect the restaurant, especially the ones right there on Franklin Street. So yeah, the students have always been a big part, especially in Chapel Hill, of supporting the restaurants. But now, that, that, is, that is interesting. And I think what they really wanna see in Chapel Hill is more businesses because you have business people who are down there all the time, they're gonna eat there. Whereas before they were just relying on students more than anything else. So, so but they, yeah, that is a really good question, so. Oh, and we've got another shout out. I love this. Um, as Chris Holiday mentioned, yes, share with us any good restaurants that you know of yeah, or any please, good please. memories you have. Uh, so we've had El Jefecito, and now we've got a shout out for Mama Dips. Now, yeah, Mama Dips. Yeah, that's me. a that's a really that's just your traditional Southern cooking, but it's a neat place. And Mildred Council, they called her Mama Dips. She was big in the culinary scene. Um, I mentioned before that in the the Black Business District of Chapel Hill on Graham Street, there was a small barbecue place called Bill's Barbecue. It's mainly just takeout, but that was Mildred Council's in laws ran that and she worked there. And that was sort of the beginning of her culinary career. And she went on to become one of the most famous, you know, culinary figures in, in the county, in the state, and probably in the South. And she's written a couple of cookbooks. I mean, she passed away a couple of years ago, but her family still runs Mama Dips and are very big in the area's culinary scene. So. Oh, we've got another shout out for cilantro Mexican food truck, another food truck. I don't know oh. that one. Yeah. It's the launcher. Yeah, we're gonna check. I, I'm saving this chat box. I'm making a big list. I'm excited for summer to open up and all these places to open up. Um, and here's a question for you: What is your favorite barbecue place? That's oh, gonna be a tough one. That sounds tough. That, well, <laughs> I'm a little biased because I'm originally from Texas, so I like Q Shack in Durham because they have beef brisket. Um, but I have learned which I grew up on, but I have learned to love pork barbecue as well. And I would have said Allen and Son uh, between Hillsborough and Chapel Hill, but it closed a couple years ago. That was a really neat old place that they smoked their wood. I mean, they smoked their barbecue with wood. Um, Hillsborough barbecue is great. Ah, uh, God, what else? Um, Picnic in Durham, right on Coal Mill Road is kind of a newer place. That's a great barbecue place too. Yeah, that's a I, good one. I hear you. It's. I feel like you could do a whole talk just on, or probably several, just on the differences of barbecue. Oh, you can. And yeah. We'll get and into I, fights over what kind of barbecue they like the best. So that's that's. <laughs> well, that is absolutely fantastic. If we have any more questions, you can pop them in now, or any other great places you would like to recommend to, to us and to everybody attending. Um, but otherwise, I'll start wrapping up. But I just want to say thank you so much to all of you coming out here tonight. And of course, thank you very much, Sherry, for the introduction. And thank you so much, Chris. This has been absolutely fantastic. Yeah, thank you, guys. And thanks to the museum. And I'm going to be at um, Purple Crow Bookshop next Friday for Friday, last Fridays in Hillsborough signing books, if anyone wants to stop by and say hi. So. Fantastic. Purple Crows? Yeah, on, on Churton Street. Well, in the corner of Churton and King, yeah. 
Excellent. Ooh, we've got another shout out, Al's Burgers. Yeah, Where's Al's Burgers is great. List? Yep. Yep. <laughs> well, this has been absolutely great. Um, and again, Chris Holiday's new book is Classic Restaurants of Orange County. Uh, he'll be yep. at Purple Crow Books next Friday. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I hope we didn't make you too hungry. Uh, and before you go, uh, if you enjoyed this program and you'd like to see us continue to offer free programs and free exhibits, the museum is free for everybody, uh, please consider supporting us. You can donate on our website. We have a donate button. And as Sherry mentioned earlier, we are running a friendship campaign. You can become a friend for the year. We have various levels starting at $25. And of course, you can get a bunch of different benefits with each one of those levels more information on our website, uh, but every single friend does get a wristband and we're going to be starting this art project this weekend. It's be a link in the chain. And what I have here is we've started off with you already. Each one of these links has a little piece of personal history, uh, maybe a secret, maybe a shout out. We have um, RIPs to several family pets. Um, and we're gonna be linking these together in front of the museum with the backdrop of the history of the museum there. This idea that we have history behind us, we have history now, we have history in front of us as well. Uh, just as we've seen with some of these restaurants you've talked about tonight, that they're, they may change over, but the building is still there or the family is still there. And the ideas of food, family, history, culture, and social importance is still there. Um, if you have any questions or need any help with anything to do with the museum, feel free to reach out to us at our website, www.orangehistorync.org, and we hope that you can come in and see date night. We have art artifacts from the ranch house, from the Carolina coffee shop, uh, and again, you can sign up to visit on our website. We are completely free. So thank you so much again. Have a happy evening and happy eating as well. Good night.